Hello and welcome to Prime Lenses. I'm Ian. Each week I speak to a photographer about three lenses that have meant something to them on their photographic journey. It's a little bit of gear chat, and it's a little bit of creativity. It's hopefully a lot of fun. My guest today is Anson Tang, who I spoke to on my birthday back in September. As that gives you an idea of how far ahead I like to record these episodes, you can take the boy out of project management. You can't take the project management out of the boy. Anyway, Anson runs uh, Tahusa, which is an online store for accessories for cameras. And I think the product he's most well known for is his soft shutter release, uh, which you can get in stainless steel or a glorious titanium finish. Uh, I also got a lens hood for my beloved Zeiss 35, which is really nice. So Anson and I have been talking for a while on Instagram, and I thought it'd be a good person to have on the show. He writes a blog about photography. He's done workshops. He's done all sorts of cool stuff. He's a great guy to chat to. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Anson. And we'll make sure that's recording some noises. And then that way, yeah, I think we're good. Leave that recording over there. And that's recording. Oops, and I'll hit the microphone. <laughs> I'm a professional, you know. I do this a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to put any... Um, any kind of cack handedness down to birthday surprises uh, and just silliness today. It's been it's been a lovely day, but it is pouring with rain. Scotland has decided oh. to be very Scotland for my birthday. <laughs> they, it, 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 oh. it got the message and was like, "Yeah, you've got the day off. Tough. Too bad. <laughs> you're doing. You're not going to do anything with your day that doesn't involve being indoors. Um, it's just the forecast was like it might rain in the afternoon. And I just woke up mm-hmm. this morning to just torrential rain. And actually, it's it, it could be worse. Parts of England and stuff, there's flooding and there's all sorts going on. So I'm, mm. I, I can't complain, really. We live on a hill. Like, we're going to be all right. Um, but yeah. It's beautiful up there. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, last yeah. year, I think last year I was in Inverness and then mm. through the NC500 all the way back to Glasgow. Oh, fantastic. Have you been, so yeah. do you come to Scotland often or was that your first no. trip, first experience? It was, it was my first experience to, mm. to Edinburgh. Starting from Edinburgh, we rent a car mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then we drove all the way to from Inverness up hill, uh, I mean up north mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. to somewhere called Tang. Yeah. And then, yeah, go back to uh, Glasgow. Yeah. yeah. It's a fun trip. Oh, it's brilliant. It's a good route. Um, that's a fun, the 500 is a fun route on a motorcycle as well. I will say that. Like it's yeah. a good, it's a good trip. And it's funny, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to uh, Stefan Daniel of Leica and he was saying he was in Straths Bay, which is where I live, over the summer. He was here with his mm. wife, with his Q3s, uh, and they were running around taking photos. And he, he was probably within within about 40 minutes drive of our house, which is just crazy to think really like small world <laughs> but scotland seems to attract a lot of people that's very good well you must come back sometime now that you know someone here as well yeah now it just give me an excuse to to come back yeah i told my wife because my wife used to study in, in yorkshire in Harrogate. oh right okay yeah 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 so um um that's that's always been a special place to to her yeah yeah that's funny because we used to live in Yorkshire. So we moved we moved yeah. to Scotland from Yorkshire. So I lived um, about 40 minutes north of York was where we used to live. So kind of like probably about an hour in a slightly different direction to Harrogate. But you, so you know mm-hmm. Betty's presumably for afternoon teas and things like that. Like all the... I've, I've only been there once yeah. <laughs> uh, for our, for my proposal. Because um, I brought her to wow. back to Harrogate and yeah, I, I, I show her the rain and yeah, it was it was it was in Harrogate. <laughs> Yay! Oh, and the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, how lovely! That's yeah. fantastic. No, really, yeah. really good. Well, yeah. Well, so that's kind of one origin story, I guess. One thing I wanted to kind of like start talking to with you because it's always nice to talk to entrepreneurs and people who run photography adjacent businesses, right? Because Harvard Business School is not throwing out people who are saying, you know, you know, if you want to get rich in the world, make camera accessories. So tell me, <laughs> kind of like. This is presumably a real passion for you and a real love. I'd, I'd love to know a bit more about like, where your beginnings with photography start and then kind of like mosey on through the engineering and the making of things. I've got oodles of questions around that. But how did you start with photography in the first instance? In the first, in the first place, how I started is my dad bought me a, a digital camera, which is a Canon G, G10, I mm-hmm. believe. And I think this camera is now 
getting a hype because it's a CCD camera. Right. Uh, yeah. um, and then in the university, my friend told me, um, do you want to try film? I said, I haven't tried it before. Maybe, you know, I took a couple of shots uh, when I was uh, still a little boy. Um, so I, I, I tried film and I was like, I only get maybe a few pictures out of, out of 36 frames, which I like. And I decided to challenge myself. I think, how can I improve the rate to get uh, you know, a better res result? So I keep shooting more film, more and more, and then I get really addict addictive to, to film. And, and also the, the, the moment that I um, uh, know about Leica, Leica cameras. And you know, holding the Leica cameras, it just gives you a very good feeling because of their quality, craftsmanship, everything. And um, I think after from from there onwards, I was always have a have a have a plan in mind that I, I want to make some sort of accessories for this camera, um, which I believe is part of my personality. Personality is kind of like like to do problem solving. Mm. So uh, for the soft release, for those who don't know, soft release is a you know a, a button that sits on on your uh, shutter uh, on your camera, which um, from I think Tom A, he, he mentioned that um, if you use that properly, it will save one to one and a half so, um, for for stabilizing your slow shutter speed. Um, and most of the most of the soft release in the market are quite sitting quite high above the, the camera, hmm. which um, I was I was trying to tackle that. Um, that's why when I plan to make it at first, I, I try to make a universal you know. Uh, screw but um in fact i'm not satisfied satisfied with that design so i it took me like six months to reiterate the, the screw um make the prototype test it test on like 11 to 20 cameras plus um to make the, the short and long version right now mm -hmm. yeah wow that's the you know <laughs> and was that that was 2023 was it because you were starting to do stuff yeah. in what 2017 so you were doing film accessories and kind of other things yeah yeah and then landed on so, the soft release yeah so i started the the, the camera block in 2017 mm. i think part of the reason is um we asked me which three lenses so mm. the first one is the noctilex the story uh came back to the the point that i read the blog which mentioned about the noctilex which i really love it I mean, after trying it, of course. But in the first hand, then I, I, I don't have this lens. I couldn't afford it. So I bought something, according to that blogger. And I tried it, and I thought, this is not not lens. So, so, so that's why I, just, I, I tried to start a blog to, um, to, to, to tell you know, different users that how, how this lens actually behaves. And I tried to include as many as, you know, different samples if, as possible like the film shots, black and white film, slide film, digital, because I believe each of them behave differently. And I want people to know about this fact that before they buy or even they spend a huge amount of money on, on Leica lenses, they know how, how it's supposed to be look like. Mm. So this is the, the reason how why I, I started Block in 2017. And, and then because I, I love shooting film, that's why I... I shoot quite a lot at that, at that point of time because film wasn't that expensive compared to uh, the price right now. It was like maybe um, in in pounds, probably like two or three pounds per roll. Of film. Oh wow, cool. Um, yeah, and you know, developing in Hong Kong especially is very easy because um, you can just drop up to the, to the lab and you can get it in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, that's how I, I started to to write more um, about analog film, different types of film. So um, um, I didn't really plan to 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 um, write as many as I can, but I try to share what I think and what I like and don't like in, mm. in, in different blog posts and try to keep it you know as honest, honest as possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. And and I think the the internet is richer for it for people like you who who kind of go to the trouble of doing this. That's fantastic if you could get film developed for that cost and that easily as well. Like how much has it gone up? Because in the UK, a roll of film could easily cost you twelve to fifteen pounds for a roll of film, depending on what you're buying and from where. And then developing it's going to be at least the same again. So you're you're probably nearly thirty pounds for a 
for a roll of film once you've got it developed and scanned and if you do prints or if you get the negatives back or you know it it can cost more to get it scanned at higher resolutions like what's what's the kind of comparison with hong kong i think in hong kong the uh, i would say this is a good or bad thing so so the bad thing about hong kong is there's always a lot of competition Mm. in the market so they always um, beat each other with the price range right um so the cheapest um, develop and scan option right now um, from a lab is, is like four, four pounds. Right. Um, yeah, develop and scan. Uh, for uh, a roll of film, I would say is roughly like eight or nine pounds okay. um, for, yeah. for the cost. So compared with you know, where, where you buy the film and how we uh, can purchase in, in Hong Kong, there's you know, a clear uh, price difference. And I think part of it is because of the tax system is quite different right. in Hong Kong and, yeah. and and in UK. So yeah, yeah. No, that's. I mean, it's 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 increased. It sounds like a reasonable amount, but it's still yeah. that's still affordable. That's still doable. And do you do you shoot your Noctilux? Like, are you one of these mad people that shoots wide open Noctiluxes pretty much all the time? Or because it's your first for the first one for you to mention. Like I noticed on the list, it's like you know, one yeah. of these lenses is not like the others. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so normally I shoot wide open, but um, I try to limit myself to use it at night. Okay. Occasionally, I'll do it um, during the day uh, with a, a neutral density ND filter, mm-hmm. um, trying to get an out of focus look. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes when I shoot in Hong Kong, uh, there are just a lot of things happening, and I want to blur, blur the, the the background. So yeah. that's the case that I'll, I'll shoot wide open during the day, but but most of the time I'll shoot portraits or street photography in Hong Kong um, with wide open, with an optics. So because I'm a big fan of, um, you know, different movies like Wong Kar Wai and, yeah. um, you know, all these um, dreamy, um, the nostalgic, nostalgic look uh, in Hong Kong mm. um, is really quite uh, pretty to be documented in a, in a Netflix. Yeah. yeah, no, it's great. You've got all the trams going around. I visited Hong Kong, I want to say 2007. I was mm. on my way to New Zealand to see some friends and oh. my uh, my mum passed away when I was 14 and she always oh. wanted to go to Hong Kong she never got there and there was this so that I was there for 2 days it just as it was like a layo extended layover on the way to New Zealand and the first morning I woke up and because my time zones were all off I woke up at like 4 in the morning and I'm like right I'm ready to go and so I went out, I sort of had an early breakfast. Dim sum is probably my favorite food. So I ate a load mm-hmm. of dim sum for breakfast very early. And then I got on the ferry over to the mainland because I wanted to see the statues and you know, it's, uh, yep. the, you know all the stuff there and see the cafes and things like that and have a look at the walk, the walk along there. And I got on this boat and I've only been in the country maybe like 10 hours. So I'm all confused and very tired. And I get on this boat and I had a bottle of water. And the only people on the ferry at that time in the morning were me. And it looked like a young woman and her grandfather. Like some, there was quite an age difference. So I assumed he wasn't her dad. I assumed he was her grandfather. And they were just chatting away or whatever. And I'm on this boat. And I sort of At this point, I'm just I'm in like 24 hours into my big five week trip around the world that I'm doing between jobs. And it's a whole big thing. And so I'm trying to be a worldly traveler. I'm trying to be like a good citizen of the world and a good traveler. And I sort of lean back and I nonchalantly smile at this these these two people on the boat. And I grab my bottle of water and take a swig. The lid was still on. No water cat, and you've never seen you've never seen two people laugh so hard in their entire lives at this idiot who's clearly trying to look cool and tried to look worldly or whatever. And I just tried to drink out of a bottle with the lid on. It wasn't. It was not my finest hour. But um, yeah, Hong Kong was cool. And yeah, I can totally see photographing at night because a lot of people photograph it during the day. Like a lot of the stuff you see is yeah. like the markets and the food and all the mm. you know the, that that kind of stuff. But yeah, nighttime must be fantastic, especially with that lens. Yeah, it is. Um, I know a lot of people find focusing with a Noctilux is difficult. Mm. Um, so I, th- I think I've done quite a lot of, lot of practice with the right. lens. So um, um, maybe I'll share more tips online about how, how to focus it about, about, uh, with that lens. But um, if you can grab that trick, you can focus it uh, quite fast with that lens. Um, and also, um, it's just amazing to use that lens at, at night. Um, because the bokeh, um, the mm. out-of-focus area is just so creamy. Yeah. And 
it is just difficult, I would say, to 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 get a pictures that you don't like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if if nothing else, it's going to be kind of pleasing in that kind of like lovely bokeh yeah. balls and softness kind of way. That's really cool. What film are you using then at night? With an because on the one hand it's very wide open, yeah. so it's letting a lot of light in. But I'm assuming you're not on like Kodak 200. <laughs> so, so normally at night, I'll it depends on mood. For um, so for color film, I'll shoot um, the reflex lab for 800 mm. film, which is um, the ramjet removed version of the 500T uh, yeah. Kodak Vision 3. Um, this is one one of the option, and the second option is the Kodak Vision 3 uh, 500T. Yeah. And then I'll push one stop to 1,000 ISO, so that I'll, I'll get a you know stable shutter speed. Um, for black and white option, probably I'll I'll push the um, Tri-X or T Max to 800 or six, uh, 1600 yeah. um, to give me a, a very stable shutter. Because the thing shooting at night in Hong Kong is the the lighting situation is quite diverse. Mm. It can be quite uh, well lit indoor. But once you step out into to, to different alleys, to uh, uh, different corridors, or just sort of standing on the corners, it could be quite dark. Mm. Um, so you have to be getting, let's say, 1600 ISO or 800 ISO with a shutter speed of 1 over uh, 30th or 1 yeah. over 50th um, uh, on second. Yeah. That, that would be, you know, um, the choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very cool. And it sounds, to, one of the things I was going to ask, but it sounds like you've already answered in some ways, you, you seem really optimistic about the future of film. Like we live in a world, 2024 is when like some new film stocks are coming out, like Phoenix yeah. and stuff. Like you, it seems like film is alive and well, you know, for you and, and will never go away. Yeah, to be honest, um, I, I have digital camera mm. and I do shoot um, uh, digital as well. But most of, most of the time I shoot like eighty percent to ninety percent of in film, yeah. Because I think the the first point is is it's just too easy to get it developed in Hong Kong. It's right. fast. The service is really good. Um, the quality is good as well. Um, and, and secondly, is just I I I like the visualization part. Yeah. The imagination of black and white, or um, I would say color film, because I know that you know from from your podcast, I know I know that you're in the gaming industry. Mm. So. Yeah. When I when I was young, uh, when I don't know, your case is different or not, but in my case is um, we don't have much information about the game, mm. so it's all about the magazine yeah. or from friends. Mm -hmm. So so what you can only know about this game is you get a chance to play that game, or you keep the imagination in your head. Yeah. So um, I think the the very addictive part for of photography or film especially is um, you can't really tell until you get the scan uh, from your camera. Um, so I would say the imagination part and the visualization of that scene, how does it perform? How how this lens pair with which uh, film stock mm. will result in different you know uh, factors. So there are so many variables that add together uh, plays as an important factor in, in, in my mind that I could imagine and visualize how it looks like. Yeah. It could be, you know, messed up, but um, sometimes the best memory um, about the scene is the, the mess up shots. Um, yeah. Maybe a role film that I've, I've never been able to, to be developed uh, in my whole life is because I didn't load it properly. Yeah. But, um, you know, all these experiences um, add up to be you know, part of our life and um, makes me you know, treasure more about the moment. Yeah. I feel that way about instant film. I think it's it's because again it's it's a happy accident when it works really, really well. And I have I have one of the hybrid uh instant cameras. So I have the, the Sofort and I have the Sofort two. And mm -hmm. there's the Sofort two is really fun, right? It's a digital camera where you crank a little lever and then it effectively prints a digital image, right? But there's there's the dynamic range isn't there and so the image is just a bit it's it's a different type of thing. Although these two things mm -hmm. side by side are both using Instax film and they're both using Instax Mini and they're kind of the same size and you know they both have a flash and a similar lens, you know, and 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 the there is just something more natural, more human, a bit more accidental about the first mm -hmm. one. That yeah. when it when it goes wrong, and it, I think like you're saying with film, like you you take on the lesson so much more 
when mm. when you mess up in analog somehow it sort of goes it's like i've recently switched back to writing stuff down with a pen rather than writing it on an ipad you know writing in a notebook and partly it's because i'm looking for that fun i'm looking for tactility um i've got mm-hmm. some pens i'll um i'll send you a link to the people i make i got my pen from like, as, as a person who makes things out of metal you'll you'll wow. love these tom studio pens yeah. from fab yeah. um they're beautifully machined um but i think i think you do take stuff it means more doesn't it when like five or yeah. six shots out of 36 are good and and mm. even the other ones you can find something to like in the accidents which is a bit easier yeah. than with digital somehow isn't it yeah it, it is um it's just going back to the to the point that you know sometimes i i do want it to be you know controllable you know we want things to be all controllable we want you know stay in the comfort zone but Sometimes shooting film with an unfamiliar focal length, mm. that's um, what I, I'll do to boost my creativity these days. Yeah. Um, just to you know, pick something that you don't normally use, like a 24 millimeter lens mm-hmm. um, with a film stock that maybe um, is new to me or you know, some, some, something that I normally use. Um, and just go somewhere that you, you, don't, you don't normally go then. You just you just create something different, and when you look at it, it might not feel that the picture is um, in your style. But however, I think when you look at it, you'll see that you can create something you know very different. Yeah. 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 Well, so on the subject of creating things that are different, how I'm curious. So you you start a comp- or you you start thinking about like problems to solve in the camera space, yeah. which I love that you came to it from a very <laughs> problem based. You know, like yeah. there's got to be a better way, and it's something that you needed, so you understand the problem intimately as well. Do you yeah. have a background in engineering to kind of know how to kind of design something yeah. for manufacture, or did you have to find someone? Because I've worked in manufacturing engineering; it's it's tough stuff yeah. to do. No, I came from a background, so so my profession is an accountant, right? So I'm an accountant, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and um, I think problem solving and being skeptical is kind mm. of in my blood to right. be you know, uh, rich how I got trained, but how I don't have any engineer background, but um, I was into um, uh, art, as in, you know, drawings, um, yeah. acrylic paintings uh, back in high school. So it's, so, so from, from the design point of view, I tried to sketch this soft release button from, from scratch, and um, I got the idea, the design idea uh, from, you know, different, different accessories like the the back button of the Wilux camera that I have mm-hmm. is just kickstart the you know whole brainstorm process. Oh, I like this button. It's so shiny. Is has that you know lovely divine edges, um, and then and then the other um, very key influence is the the Rolex platinum ring. Yes, um, the 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 uh, very fine Swiss um, watchmaking um, quality. So these two are the combination of how I get started in the, in the, in when I brainstorm to do the sketch. Right. So once I got the sketch, how do I execute? Right. How, how do I find people to help me to realize this um, um, uh, product? Hmm. So I got a very good friend of mine who got connection with you know different factories and um, let's put it to, into actions. So I received a prototype um, and then. From the prototype onwards, I, I got the technical drawing and I refined different measurements and check everything. And then I got the screws because I, I need to check the screw uh, to fit on different cameras, mm-hmm. whether this it would be tilted, whether I need to, um, like an O-ring or um, like ha- other soft release buttons. Yeah. Um, there are you know so many steps that I need to execute, but but then I need to you know solve each one by one. Yeah. And I know. You are a project manager, so yeah. you have a timeline, right? Yeah. So um, I didn't really have that timeline uh, when I when I do this project, but I have something in mind. But um, recently, I used the Google Sheet. There's a timeline planning. Yeah. I input all the timeline that I actually did with this soft release, and then I we look at you know which process actually took up most of my time, and how I could improve it for mm-hmm. next time. So I think this is a very good learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, f- I like to say that I think everyone's a project manager, really. 
um like it's you know steven spielberg is a project manager like just at a very high level like obviously there's all the other stuff mm. that goes into it but i think if you can and I, I am in danger of saying this knowing that when you have a hammer everything looks like a nail but i think if you can as an individual if you can manage your own time like that and understand you just understand the way that things happen and the the impact of one thing on another i think that's a superpower I think that can that could because you start to see the world in terms of stages and breaking it down mm. and and starting to make stuff. I was talking to Victor from Fjorden a few weeks ago who made the grip for phones and they they make the Leica yeah. Lux uh camera phone app as well. And they make, but they make this really cool grip that you can put onto your phone and kind of make it a more kind of digital camera like experience but when you're using your phone which is pretty cool and he was talking about like 3d printing and stuff like that did you use any of that kind of additive manufacture type process to help prototype things because your thing's very small so you could make quite a lot of yeah. variations quite quickly i would have thought yeah unfortunately i i didn't get into you know 3d printing at that mm. time, point of time but right. i'm planning into you know looking at how i could start you know playing around with the 3d printer yeah. so that i can you know try different uh, accessories, um, maybe potentially a grip or mm. a better thumb thumbs up, um, all these kind of um, things that I we could improve uh, in terms of ergonomic yeah. or usability. Yeah, it's really good. So when I was using it about ten years ago. I say I was using it. My boss and the company I worked for were using it. Like we were using it to prototype stuff, and then we were making a a piece of um, instrumentation DNA analysis machine. Uh, where um, the lid was like a camera lens it was like a bayonet type fit mm. and we were using a 3d printer to kind of prototype that lid feel you know for like how far down do you want to push it before it locks into place and and how does it come up mm. in fact there's thousands okay. of those machines out in the world now and they have my voice in them so there's labs really? all over the world <laughs> yeah it was I, I was the voice for when you put the lid on so that you know it's connected it says lid locked oh lid removed lid locked when you do that so there's labs all over the world where they hear my voice every day whilst they're doing experiments uh and dna analysis it's quite cool but yeah that was that it was it was really good i'd recommend it for stuff like that because you can you can sort of iterate very fast and the pieces the plastics used and stuff now are so good that you could iterate a shutter release or a hood or something like that and it'll give you can you can use it almost like the real thing for quite a while like the plastic if you're rubbing up against metal it wears away quite quickly so mm -hmm. you can't use it for a long time but you could you can spray it up and you can treat it in such a way that like it would give you a weekend's worth or a few days worth of like oh yeah this feels kind of right the thing would be if it was threading in and out it'll probably yeah. wear down against the brass you know on the button or something like that yeah. but yeah it was really cool for trying stuff out because before that we used to have to send things away to factories they would take weeks to come back and mm. the only downside was you want to be careful posting pictures on social media because people think it's finished when you've got a 3d <laughs> printer and you go no no, no. <laughs> we're yeah. not we're not there's a danger you spray paint this thing up and it looks real and then people go cool can i buy one and you go well <laughs> this is all fake this is all smoke and mirrors but yeah it's very good so for you then you sort of hinting at it there in terms of thinking about it on future stuff what where next for for the company and for the button you know you've got the shutter releases you've got titanium and stainless steel mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful things what's yeah. kind of next oh i will say i've got your lens hood uh for my 35 <laughs> for my beloved okay. 35 this is great i love it <laughs> it fits yeah, glad, brilliantly so glad to hear yeah it's really really good i was I was very excited to order that and the, the lens hood goes on beautifully and I get it's funny since I got since I got the lens hood I get compliments from other photographers about how nice my silver lens is and the silver lens was always there but I think it's the lens hood that people see and they go <laughs> oh now it looks like an old camera and now it's you know it's, got, it's quite nice but it's got lovely makes a lovely noise for for the lens hood is made by another maker so um because of that hood I bought the lens. Mm, <laughs> I bought the 35 1.5 lens. Um, and I, I know that you're a big fan of the 35 2.8 mm. size lens. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I should borrow one from my friend to try it. I, I, I'm wondering how the high contrast um, paired with, you know, different film stocks that I use, um, mm. how, how does it look like? That that would be maybe awesome, yeah. Yeah, it's very zicey. It's very, it's quite sharp. 
uh, in the centre, and then that falls away in a really kind of interesting vintage way. I'll send you a picture after after we've spoken. Where my I got one of my son, in um, it was like very sunny day, very very bright, harsh sunlight, and it it really renders the detail in black and white in a really beautiful way. Um, but it is very modern and more kind of clinical. Like I noticed because this yep. weekend I was using my Sumacron fifty. I've got the V5, I think it is, Sumacron 50, mm -hmm. uh, with the integrated hood, which is quite nice. Yeah, internal hood. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was using that a lot, and that, it almost felt soft, and it's not. It's a sharp lens, but it, by mm. comparison, you switch back to the 35, and you go, oh, yeah. And that's, that, I think, is the joy of having an interchangeable system is that you can yeah. see those different yeah. and enjoy those different kind of characteristics and go, you know. So yeah. I feel like it's, it's especially well suited to black and white. And if you want modern looking, uh, sort of sharper, modern sort of contrasty images, then that's that's my go to. And if I want something, I think that's it'll be interesting for you because you're sort of often shooting stuff wide open like this is more of a yeah. I like to sort of stick it at five, six and even yeah. F8 and have a very textured and detailed kind of all in focus rich field of view um, but yeah i'd love to see your photos and see what you think of that because it, it's yeah it's very different <laughs> to what you normally use by the sounds of it yeah so, sounds perfect um speaking about uh you know camera and lenses i'm expecting your m m5 where is it <laughs> <laughs> no see this is the danger with saying things out loud on a podcast um it's funny mm -hmm. i was talking to tiffany uh, the other week on, on Instagram, yeah. she's traveling at the moment. She's in Sri Lanka doing a load of stuff. Uh, and yeah, she asked me the same question. She's like, where, where is the M5? I don't know. See, the problem, I'm chicken about film. I'm, I'm a bit scared, mm -hmm. to be honest, to go and do it. But I think I should because I mentioned it to yeah. Stefan as well. And he was like, it's maybe not the prettiest M they've ever made. And I was like, no, but it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's cool. Uh, it's cool. I agree that it's boxy, like the yeah. um, Lamborghini and you know the eighties kind of style. Yeah, my my friend is a big fan of the M five, mm. uh, which he bought one in in black color. Yeah, and then I hold I hold it once, and I like the grip. Yeah, and it feels like it's just right in in my in my hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. The black ones seem to be harder. To, part of the reason I haven't done it as well is that I haven't found a good example of one that doesn't mm -hmm. seem kind of either very very expensive which i know they won't get cheaper because they're not making them anymore mm -hmm. there's never gonna i don't think they're ever gonna do a reissue m5 somehow i can't see them doing that <laughs> but i i really like the two lugs on the side as well i think that's yeah. a really interesting because how really do you cool. how do you wear your camera when you're carrying it do you sort of just do you have it in a bag or are you a wrist strap kind of person um Usually I'll put it in the back, but mm. when I when I shoot on the streets, I don't want people to notice that I am photographing them. Right. So I'll I'll wrap the whole strap on my wrist yeah. mm. without not a short. It's not a short um, wrist strap, yeah. but a long strap that I'll just wrap on my wrist. Yeah, because I feel like that's that's kind of like part of the key is like just how do you knowing you can get to it quickly that's why i like the two lug idea because it kind of fits with the way i use my camera because mm -hmm. i think a lot of people quite like quite rightly i'm seeing recently a lot of people doing the shorter strap again so it's almost the camera is at chest height the whole time and then they're ready they're kind of ready I've ordered one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking about Tiffany, she had um, she she made me spend on on camera. So so I don't know her personally, but mm. um, I sh I saw her like an MP with the gray or beige kind of like um, camera skin. Yeah. And I just love that, and and it made me change the camera skin on my MP into oh, a gray. Oh, cool. No, yeah. It's because of that. Yeah. <laughs> I I think that's the power of you know social media when you see something. Mm -hmm that is different and you know quite disdain you really want to you know follow the steps yeah, yeah. well she has a q2 ghost now which is a, the light colored mm. 
silver yeah. and light finished version of the Q2, which is a beautiful camera. Um, but I'm not sure I can ever go fixed lens again. I kind of, I think about it occasionally and then I think, no, I can't. I can't. Like, I think if I was going for a smaller <laughs> camera again, it would have to have some sort of zoom. It has to, has yeah. to do something different, you know? Otherwise, yeah. what's the point? I've got, you know, an amazing camera or I can just use that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm keen to see what she does. And she's very good at um, making her digital and her analog pictures basically mm. indistinguishable from one another. Like I can, I can never tell which ones are her film photos and which ones are her digital ones. Yeah, In fact, she um, she posted some stuff recently, which was very close up of like flowers. And she mm-hmm. was messaging me. She was like, you know, guess, guess the kind of camera. And I went, I don't know, maybe like a foam one. And she was like, I'm offended. <laughs> and <she's just> like, <laughs> my, my eye was clearly failing me that day. And she was just like, no, 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 not doing that. Well, which of your three lenses on the subject of lenses? Um, would you want to talk about next the 35 or the other 50? Yeah. Maybe the 35 first. Okay. Um, so, so, so that lens is the Leica Summicron 35 f2 mm-hmm. version one, um, AKA eight element. Mm. So the reason why it called eight element is because they have, uh, it had uh, eight pieces of glasses inside. Um, I don't know much too much technical about the lens. I know that there are eight pieces and the reason why having more, you know, elements inside will decrease the contrast of your lens. So this is what I heard. I'm not, I'm not some, someone who's um, uh, expert in, in terms mm. of the uh, optical, but I know that um, the, the eight elements has lower contrast than the seven elements, and uh, the six elements will have a higher contrast than the seven elements. So, so that's how um, you know, people differentiate the versions. So what's so special about the eight elements? This is a question in my mind when I first look at this lens. Mm. Um, it's an F2 lens. It's not, you know, 1.4. It doesn't create, you know, super dreamy bokeh, and, but it, it's just expensive at the time. Yeah. Um, I know the price has gone up doubled already, um, but when I, when I first bought the lens, it's just half of that price. Um, and also the reason why I made an ebook about, you know, how to invest in Leica lenses, about mainly about 35 mil and 50 lenses, is because... Um, when you look at the price trend, you know what is the lenses. What are the lenses that going up with the hype, and mm-hmm. what is the real deal? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so speaking about this lens, um, I'm just curious about why so good. You know why Japanese people are so obsessed with this lens. So I save my money and I bought one, and 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 this lens became my first lens that I travel um, solo. Um, because at that time I, I just took I just bought um, a ticket and I flew from Hong Kong to Berlin and travel around uh, Berlin, Munich, and uh, Salzburg, mm. and just one camera, uh, two sorry, two cameras, the M2 with this 35 mm lens and the X-Pen. Um, don't be shocked about the X-Pen because back in those days X-Pen wasn't that expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's only um, I would say a thousand pound. Yeah. Which for, which for that but, type of camera is is a steal, really, yeah. for because there's nothing yeah. quite like it. Yeah. Um, so so after the trip, I, I don't have much expectation on the photos. Um, I brought, I, I shot mostly in black and white for for with, with that camera. And then when I look at the pictures, I was amazed uh, because the details, um, how the the lens could be, um, you know, dealing with different situations like back, backlit. Um, uh, kind of light, or if you take some sort of portrait, or even f2 wide open, the lens just gives you that kind of poetic and descriptive kind of painting look. Um, that's why I, I, I go so obsessed with, with this lens. And then I, I continue to use this 35mm lens for, for my next backpacking trip to um, different places. And then in the end, I feel like I've shot enough photos to tell the difference about this lens from, you know, let's say seven elements, like the different versions of the Simicron. Then mm. I eventually write this uh, on my blog. Yeah. yeah. And to complete the whole process, I took the film, the negative to the dark room to print it. Right. And I can tell, you know, why people love this lens so much. It's the amount of detail that's stored on the, on the negative. Uh, it's just truly amazing. Yeah. yeah. And now do you find that it, you were talking about envisaging the photograph in your mind when you're shooting with film do you did you envisage it 
before the trip, like this trip. When I remember this trip, I want it to have a look, you know? I would say mm, when I when I when I use certain film or lens on a trip, there's always a aha moment. This is probably the the best shot in my trip. So even though right now every trip that I travel, uh, I'll I'll get one or two shots that will you know make me feel that aha. Uh-huh. Um, and in visualizing, I mean, um, I I still visualize as in looking at the light, how this place is 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 is, is it perfectly lit, um, or um, the direction of the light that is shining on that subject. So this is you know play the major part in my you know visualization uh, rather than um, trying to uh, look or chase for some sort of you know scene you know, in, in, for the photos. Yeah. And has that led into kind of how you structure your courses and things like that when you're sort of taking students on? Because it sounds like you've done a lot of the hard work and the thinking for, for us. Yeah. Um, so, so in 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 my blog, I try to you know break down my thinking process. But as what you also asked me before, what's my next product, right? So, so the upcoming product is mostly on digital side. Uh, it will be more on you know courses or uh, maybe workshop that um, I want to share my experience on using all these different Leica lenses together with the film. Um, It's because I I don't want people to waste money to buy the lenses that they need to uh, get this and in the result that they don't like it and they they waste so much money and just go around in in the rabbit hole. So yeah, in in terms of the workshop or maybe an ebook or um, other you know digital materials that I could mm-hmm. help you know different people um, uh, maybe um, let's say a Zoom call together to to chat about gear like how we're doing right now. So yeah, um, yeah. No, I really like it. It's it's a really I think community is kind of like a, a it's funny we've never been more connected. But I think it's easy to also feel very alone. I think the pandemic taught us all of that. Like mm. we, were, we were all staring at screens all day. And if we were lucky, we were at home with someone else that we liked. You know, I was very fortunate mm. through that time that I had my family with me and we had a garden. Like, but, but for a lot of people, I can imagine being a lot of time indoors and it was a very scary time. And I think finding a genuine community of people you can have a, a meaningful conversation with. It's why I love these conversations yeah. so much. It's such a treat to talk to people and yeah. kind of like <laughs> hear their perspective. So I think community is, is a big part of it. Do you think that the stuff you're doing would work as a community around another brand? Or do you think there's something about, I'm leading the witness a little bit here, but do you think there is something about the Leica community that's a little bit different? Or could you see yourself doing like the Canon R community after this or a Rico GR or something like that? So um, I, I try to not label them, you know, in right. different brands. Um, yeah, because I always welcome, you know, different people to join mm-hmm. um, the photo walks. Because I used to organize different photo walks in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the highest peak, um, there were 25 people attending uh, cool. in the single photo walk. Yay. So imagine 25 people walking together together on the streets. That's amazing. Uh, but of course, that will be uh, becoming a, kind of like a photo talk mm-hmm. <laughs> rather than, you know, taking pictures together. But um, I would I would say I still treasure the moments uh, that we we do photo walks together and also the reason how uh, and the events that how I met uh, some some of the very good friend of mine um, uh, the like minded um, people that we chat about gears all night all day long yeah um, and also uh, be able to learn about and share about the skills from from different people because some of them um, should like Bruce Gilden they yeah. like to use the flash to point at someone. Um, and the other one would be maybe an observer that would use a telefocal lens at focal length. And, you know, each time we, we're just learning different people's um, style and try to, you know, share what they're good at, what we are maybe uncomfortable about, you know, taking portraits. Mm-hmm. And each of us will just encourage people to, you know, maybe step forward a little bit, um, try to take that shot. If you're uncomfortable about that, just ask that person mm-hmm. whether, you know, uh, uh, I can take a photograph of you. So, um, in some cases, when I sometimes when I try different lenses, I'll tr- I'll, I'll I'll tell them. Um, let's say today we need to take let's say three portraits. Right. I'll ask I'll ask the first person first. 
and you go next. Mm -hmm. And after he or she asked them, it, it just built up that momentum. So now my friend will, will just keep asking different people for photographs. And, you know, um, the, the community in Hong Kong is quite small, to be honest. Um, the routes that we always go is just the same route. Mm. And, and there was one time that I took a photograph during pandemic for, 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 an, um, for an uncle holding a birdcage. Mm. is is a kind of like a traditional thing to be you know keeping a bird at yeah. home um and then one day um after like two or three years one day i saw him i i don't remember him because he was wearing, wearing a mask during that time mm. and i and i and i just go forward and i say last time i asked you for a photograph is that you and then he said yes and can i take a photograph of you of you again he said yes so you know that 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 yeah. conversation become you know kind of meaningful, and he yeah. he just had a very big smile on his face, and you know uh, my friend can also um, enjoy it together and share that moment. So this is something that I, I feel you know very that's why I'm passionate about you know having uh, photo walks together with friends and and also one of the person that I met uh, his name is Arthur he is mm -hmm. doing different photo collage and it's just interesting to see you know how how different people create you know, photography differently. Yeah. Yeah. I think your community connection thing there is, is a really important aspect of this as well. Like it's why I love the work of Andre Wagner and the way that he is so much a part of the communities that he photographs and those people know him. And so the photos look incredible in isolation. You would just look at them and think that every time he walks out on the street, he manages to make an incredible photograph. Like they're just all bangers. Mm. But actually I think what's happened is he's, he's embedded in the place he lives and he's known to people and the places he goes on his photo walks. He's, he's not just going once and snapping something. It's like you were saying there that takes years for you to mm. be, you know, how many times you've spotted that guy? Well, he's probably seen you walking around with the camera mm -hmm. and knows you. And so knows knows that there's nothing untoward. And we, you sort of trust people's motives after yeah. a while if you kind of see them walking around. It's the same reason I'm always carrying a camera around the village, just so that people know, yeah, that's the guy with the camera. Like, so, you know, of course, <laughs> of course, he has a podcast about photography, yeah, totally on brand. Um, and you earn the right, I think, by doing that. It's the same at the studio where I work, right? You always carry around a camera, you know, just in case, because you never know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I, I think it's very important that um, even though maybe some people say no, when mm. you ask for a photograph, maybe one or two years later, you just explain what you're doing and show them your projects. And maybe they'll say yes. Yeah. Just try to explain that. Um, I always teach, not teach, but share the, the technique with you, my friend in, in Hong Kong, how, how you can approach someone. Um, you can just tell them you're doing a photo project and they yeah. appreciate that, to be honest. And I'm using film. And, you know, the, the older generation had some sort of fawn about some people using film mm -hmm. and they're curious about what, what you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I heard something once from someone on a, a talking about street photography and they were saying that person, if a person's saying no, the thing to remember is they're not saying no to you. They're saying no to mm. this thing happening right now. And you don't know what's going on in their world, but it's probably got nothing to do with you. It's probably yeah. got everything to do with they're stressed at work, they're running late, they're doing whatever. But a lot of people will be really pleased that you asked and they're quite, you know, they're quite excited. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, that's, I could remember my own advice occasionally and try that because there are the photos that get away and you just think oh that would have been cool you know that person looked amazing <laughs> could have been a fun mm -hmm. portrait well do you use your last lens for those kinds of portraits because i don't know yeah. this lens at all you're gonna have to talk <laughs> me through because from from looking it up it looks like it creates the most wild images mm. how on earth did you yeah. find it and what is it so first of all, this lens is called Dormeyer uh, Kinematograph, uh, 50 millimeter f 1.9. Mm -hmm. And this lens should be made by a, the Dormeyer company, which is origin from, from the UK. Um, so, so why this lens? So there's always something planned in my head about pet steel lenses. So pet steel lenses is, is, should, should be the most common lens design back then that has the very great center point sharpness and everything will just fall apart and yeah. give you a very swell bokeh. Um, uh, it, it could be an uh, imperfection at the time, but it's like a break, breakthrough to have a large and fast lens um, mm. in, in a large format um, back in those days. So 
one day I watched a movie uh, called Poor Things. Mm. I'm not sure if you uh, yeah, watched that, but um, you know the whole the whole movie shot with kind of interesting swirly bokeh, and it's result from uh, the past few lens, mm. and 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 from online it said is is it was shot with the lumography eighty five mil. Um, I forgot, the, I forgot the aperture, but the 85 mil pet steel lens. Right. So I was wondering, hmm, where could I find a lens that could be usable uh, on a Leica camera mm. that also with the rangefinder focusing? Because there's only one lens um, in, the, in the Leica world that is called a pet steel lens. It's from the MS Optics, which Miyazaki uh, is the guy, is a Japanese uh, uh, uncle that produce uh, different very compact pancake lenses. And he, he also made different, you know, old lenses replicate. Uh, they, they, he, he tried to replicate and refine the lens formula to, to bring out the vintage mood mm. the lenses. And he has that, you know, past few lenses. So I bought one, I tried it. Mm, it doesn't look like something that I wanted. <laughs> so, so the idea just sat back. But one day I saw um, someone Posted this Dormeyer lens, and and I asked uh, the shop um, how much is it. Of course, it's 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 quite expensive to be honest. Mm. Um, and then I I just put the idea away. But one day I don't know why I asked one of the photographer that I like. His his name is called Paul Cox, and he used a Dormeyer lenses uh, for portraits. He took a lot of portraits in Mongolia. He documented Mongolia with uh, Dormai lens. I don't, I don't, I don't know why. Somehow, I thought this is a Super Six lens, because a Super Six Dormai costs costs you a fortune. Right. And I messaged him, say, "Hey, Paul, do you normally use a Super Six or this Kimatograph?" He said, "Kimatograph." I was like. Oh yes! Oh yes! <laughs> the dream lives. Oh huh! Yeah, <laughs> and then I went back to the shop. Say, um, can this lens be, you know, modified into the look that I want? And they said yes. So I took the challenge. I modified the lens, um, and then I put the lens on my M10 monochrome. And this is the this is how the journey began. Right. Um, because using a, a pass field lens, it will create um, a weird, I would say, weird and unusual swirl. Mm. And you, t- you need to know how to control this swirl by adjusting your distance with your subject. So if you get closer to your subjects, that swirl doesn't look at, um, as unusual as what you think. But um, if your subject is further away, like uh, two meters, mm-hmm. the whole scene will be continually you know, swirling, spinning. At the yeah. background, so um, I, I took the lens with me with the monochrome, and I went to the Jap- I went to Japan to meet my friends, um, and then the whole trip, I majority of the time I used this lens um, to to shoot portraits uh, with different you know Japanese people, and just enjoy it um, because it pushed me to focus on making portraits. Um, it could be somehow a portrait that. You know, people are focusing on the expression, um, or somehow people are doing something on their own, or you just ask them for 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 a portrait, and if they say yes, then of course, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that's really lovely. I I, I encourage everyone listening to go and find pictures from this lens because <laughs> it is. It's unique. Like it's one of those ones. Obviously, making a podcast about photography can be expensive to varying degrees. But I would love to try one of those lenses. I like it's. I'm gonna either have to get on a plane and see if I can try yours, or try and find <laughs> one locally or something. Because yeah, it's a wild look. It's amazing. And poor things is incredible. Um, I yeah. studied Scottish literature, so that story is well known. It made a bit of a splash when that book came out. I was studying. Mm-hmm. It was around about the time I was still studying when it when it came out, and it was a it was a big deal of like a, a Scottish novel like that, like a sort of uh, this woman living on her own terms like that. It's a fantastic movie. Um, Emma Stone was the lead, wasn't she? Yeah, Emma yeah, Stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very good. She's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, what an amazing lens. What's funny is when I was making my notes and kind of preparing for this conversation, I had them in the other order. I was going to end 
on the um, Noctilux because that's like that's the big deal. But actually, I think you've done it in a much more satisfying way because you've <laughs> you've ended on the really unusual one, uh, which is really really nice. Are you kind of do you have another kind of white whale lens at the moment that you're looking at for your for for a project or or is actually all of your photography taken up with work? and kind of trying things and stuff like that? Or do you still have space for like your own projects and like ideas with different lenses? Yes, um, so for my for my own project, uh, so, so there, there'll be two parts. The first part is I'm just like to try different new things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you're listening to, listening to this podcast, if you have, you know, something interesting, please send it to me. I'll, uh, I would love to test it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, on, on that part, um, let's say before, um, a blog reader uh, sent me his uh, set of camera. It's called a Noris, Norita camera. Uh, it's a medium format camera with uh, the widest um, aperture that you could think of is f2. And I used that to do some uh, night photography as a project. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so, so that part kickstart that I, w I would like to do continuing my you know, night photography projects mm -hmm. in terms of street photography, or um, documenting um, um, different places in Hong Kong because uh, Hong Kong keeps changing every single day. There are a lot of you know neon sign being taken down. Um, so one day I, I could take a photograph of this place with a nice neon sign as a background, mm -hmm. and maybe 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 half six months later it's gone. Yeah. So so um, you you don't know whether you know the places that you're documenting will be gone or you're just focusing on that place itself mm. or so I, I want to keep doing this in terms of let's say um doing portraits for people yeah. and using different different sets of um, locations in hong kong and to represent you know the, the place itself so this is something that i'm continue doing asking friends uh, to be my model mm -hmm. or asking asking strangers um for uh, for portraits in certain areas that is something in my project is kind of like ongoing and yeah on the other side is keep trying you know different different new things yeah no i'm with you i love to try new stuff i'm uh, i think trying to be open and to to try yeah. lots of things all the time is is so important because otherwise you can trap yourself and get stuck in your yeah. way and just go there's the, this is this is the way and there's no other way and if you don't you know open yourself up to things then we never get really nice quick uh like soft release shutters made from titanium and stainless steel yeah you know, potentially in red one day who knows i'm just yeah, planting actually. seeds i'm yeah. just planting seeds yeah <laughs> well <laughs> thank you for taking the time to talk to us i really really enjoyed chatting with you where to people who don't know who are just listening to a nice conversation between two blokes about cameras where can they find a the blog and also the store with the stuff so if you if you would like to check out my blog page, you can go to um, www.tahusa.co, which is um, t a x u s a dot c o. Um, for Instagram, you can also check out my um, personal account, which is t a x u s a or um, t a x u s a dot co. So uh, for shops, which is shops dot t a x u s a dot c o. Yeah, you'll be able to find you know camera hoods, accessories, soft release. Uh, ebooks yeah etc <laughs> really good and i will obviously put links to that in the show notes as well yeah, thank um, you very much but yeah oh no of course uh, like i say i'm i mean i bought my own lens hood right and it's lovely and so to be able to actually spend some time telling the person who kind of sourced it and has made some stuff like it's really really nice and i'm sure i will inevitably get the shutter uh, at a certain point um this red one now that i look at it it is tall it does stick up <laughs> and, and it's one of those things you know you can see it which kind of red um do you want <laughs> well whichever whichever one comes in red uh i am just a victim for that sort of stuff i remember wayne in the san francisco store when i was in san francisco my i'd bought a cheap camera strap and it broke and i went in and and, mm -hmm. and i needed a replacement camera strap like a good one and um he had the Leica ones in and i said do you have a red one because i like to i just like to have a red accessory and he just looked at me with disdain and he was like, no, it's like, I have a black one or a brown one. I was like, black it is then. But I, I do prefer a red. And my red shutter release, a soft release, is just a very simple, you know, it's probably about seven quid on Amazon. It's not, I've, I've lost a few already. You know, they fall out. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but um, no, you I, I like a nicely styled one of those 
in a red on the top is nice because my kids think that Leicas all have red buttons. Um, that's mm. that's the treat I've given them. But yeah, it's nice. I think I prefer a soft release for the same reason you do, though. It's it's that kind of nice, you know, just a little bit less shake. I think it's a good it's good technique to have even if you're not shooting film. You know, I think mm. it's because you can get you can set the ISO on this thing to you know, 3,200 and barely see the grain, uh, especially in black and white, get away with absolute mm. murder. Um, so, yeah, so I, I like to shoot at high ISOs quite often on purpose anyway, uh, and to have kind of, especially using something like the Zeiss to try and keep mm. things as stable and get as much out of that center sharpness as possible and let mm-hmm. let the rest of the lens do the work in terms of the fall off. But hey, we all have our own peculiar setups right like there's there's several ways to achieve the same thing i'm aware that i'm a i'm making unreasonable demands of of you know everything must have red accessories but there we go (laughs) cool well enjoy the rest of your evening sir have a wonderful time and um, happy birthday to you thank Um, you yeah yeah yes it's Uh, uh, good have a good rest with your family i will i will i'm going to i've got carrot cake alice made me a carrot cake um, nice. which is the picture that was the cake I posted on our Instagram this morning, which I posted with a very big candle. It's not a tiny cake. It just has a very big candle. But I was getting messages mm-hmm. of people going, the cake looks very small. Like it's <laughs> sort of perfectly full of small cake. Um, I'll link to that in the show notes as well. But yeah, well, have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Anson, so much. I really Thank enjoyed you. this. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah of course. Thank you. All right, mate. All Take right. care. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Anson for being on the show. That was a great chat, wasn't it? And you should go to Tahusa and get yourself a soft release shutter, whether they come in red or not. But hopefully they'll come in red at some point soon. Or maybe a prime lens is yellow. Maybe I'm doing this wrong. Maybe we should do a collab. While I go and hit him up on Instagram, if you enjoyed that conversation, then you can hit us up with a five-star review, please, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also sign up to the newsletter on ianfarrell.com slash sign dash up. We also have a Patreon if you would like to support the running costs of the show. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, it would be really, really great. So, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, next week, we'll be back with another guest and three more lovely lenses. Have a great week. 